Hello everyone, welcome to Expert Talks. This is the interview series with thought leaders in the analytics, AI and transformation space. My name is Mahadevan Ayer, Maha for short. I'm your host for today. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Marketplace for On-Demand Analytics Services. Our guest for today is Gary Calkins. Gary is an internationally acclaimed expert, speaker, and author. Gary is the founder and CEO of analytics-based performance management. His company is based in South Carolina in USA. Gary started his career as a finance professional and was a finance controller with a division of one of the Fortune 500 companies in US. He has authored many books on activity-based costing and corporate and enterprise performance management. Gary also has had the good fortune of working with Harvard Business School professors, Dr. Robert Kaplan and David Norton, who are the creators of uh, Balance Scorecard. He's also a co-author of a book called Predictive Business Analytics. Gary, it's a pleasure having you here on this Expert Talks interview. Thank you so much for making time. My pleasure, Maha. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, Gary, tell us something about your career, the advancement in your roles, and how did analytics happen there? I've already had a successful 40-year career. It also included, you mentioned earlier in my career, uh, age 27, I was a financial division controller, but then I spent about 35 years as a consultant with Deloitte, then KPMG, uh, then EDS, Electronic Data Systems, which is now part of Hewlett Packard. And then I was 16 years with SAS. Many people don't recognize who's SAS, the SAS Institute. It's actually the world's largest privately owned software vendor uh, in analytics, 15,000 employees, kind of like the major data science uh, company. I think careers have a lot more to do with luck and circumstances than being smart and competent. And I had a lucky break when uh, in 1988, KPMG struck an exclusive contract with Harvard Business School Professor Robert S. Kaplan, who you mentioned. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about Balance Scorecard, but he did the early pioneering work in a method in management accounting called activity-based costing. I got recruited. I implemented this ABC, that's its acronym, for five years. I then wrote a book and that led to many more books. So, and I'm not encouraging any of your attendees to go buy my books, but if you go to wiley.com or Amazon, usually chapter one's a free download. So again, thank okay. you for uh, inviting me. Oh, my undergraduate degree, industrial engineering and operations research from Cornell University. And I got my MBA at Northwestern University's Kellogg uh, School of uh, Management. Oh, nice. OK, so Gary, there is an increasing level of uh, interest when it comes to analytics in enterprise and, uh, you know, corporate uh, performance management. So so what are the uh, some of the reasons? How do you see organizations adopting this? If you can expand a little more on that. Yeah, well, there's several reasons. These are what's caused the interest in them. And this is going to take me two, three minutes. I kind of go through a list. The first one is executives frustration with strategy failure. They're quite good at formulating the strategy or they'll bring in a high end consulting firm to help them. Their frustration is failure to successfully implement it. And there's some empirical evidence on this. Uh, I was raised in Chicago. Coincidentally, there's a Chicago based executive recruiting firm, Challenger Gray and Christmas. They monitor the involuntary turnover of CEOs, firing of CEOs. And every year it has been an increasing number. And I believe it's post Enron Board of Governors mm -hmm. take their job really uh, seriously. And if the executive's not implementing the strategy, they're fired. Carly Fiorini at Hewlett Packard, a good example. A second cause, increased accountability. Today, there is mm -hmm. no place to hide. Managers and employees mm -hmm. will be monitored. They will be measured. It doesn't necessarily mean their jobs are at risk, but it could mm -hmm. adversely impact their salary increases and job promotions. Next, mm -hmm. 
more rapid decision making. You know, unlike a few years ago, you could test and learn and have meetings and conference rooms. Today, people are on the phone, go or no go, yes or no. They need to make a decision in real time. They almost wish an executive was sitting next to them saying, what should my decision be? Fourth, mistrust of the management accounting system for accuracy and transparency. You know, quite frankly, most managers don't trust the internal management accounting system. And it has to do with this overhead alloc cost allocations. It's correctly called indirect expense compared to direct expense. And in many organizations, the indirect can be 50% of the expenses. And the problem there is the accountants, they kind of get lazy. They take this overhead and they spread it like butter across bread to do product costing or service <laughs> costing and the like. And of course, it's inaccurate. The solution there is this technique called activity-based costing. Next, poor customer value management. You know, the reality is customers are the source of financial wealth creation for shareholders and, and owners. And we really need to connect how the measurements of customer to shareholder are. The problem is the accountants do not calculate customer profitability. They stop halfway down in an income statement at what's called gross profit margin analysis for products and service lines. They really need to include distribution channel expenses, marketing expenses, selling expenses, cost to serve to get a profit and loss statement for each customer. And when they do that, it's always a shock to the team, the executives and the managers, because they'll discover, oh, our largest customer in sales is unprofitable. How could that be? Well, when you look at how demanding big customers can be, always changing delivery schedule, never buying standard, always special, always calling help desk, always returning goods, all of that, they can be more expensive. And why this is measurements important, and I'll get to it perhaps later with the other questions, is what sales and marketing is asking is, which type of customer is most attractive to retain, to grow, to win back or acquire? Which types are not attractive? So they really need to know that information. Next, oh, this is a real reason, the budgeting process. The annual budgeting process, in my opinion, is broken. It's a disaster. You know, it's out of date in a couple of months after you publish it anyway. It caves into the loudest voice and strongest muscle of the veteran sandbagging, you know, managers who know how to basically deal with it. Um, there's a lot of use it or lose it behavior when a manager is a couple of months from the end of the fiscal period uh, uh, and they haven't spent all of the budget that was allotted to them. What do they do? They start spending it needlessly, foolishly. Why? Because they think that the budget for the next year will be pegged to the platform, you know, of, of this year. Next, dysfunctional supply chain management. Now, this doesn't apply to everybody, only those that are in the B to B business to business with trading partners. But the issue there is many customers view their suppliers as the enemy. You know, it's an adversarial relationship, you know, and they will basically try to negotiate much lower prices from their suppliers. And if they put a supplier out of business, they say, so what? We'll get another supplier. That's got to stop. It needs to be a marriage because supply chains are competing against other supply chains for share of wallet and purse. So they have to really collaborate together to find mutually beneficial projects and initiatives that can save all of their money. And finally, unfulfilled return on investment promises from large IT systems like enterprise resource planning. Um, and if you ask a chief information officer, IT director, let's say a couple of years after they've gone through the long journey of implementing an ERP system, you, you ask them, how well do you think the return on investment has met or exceeded what the software salesman sold you on two years ago? A lot of them go, I'm not sure. We put in a lot of time and effort. I don't know if we got the payback. Well, the message there is there's a difference between data and information. The ERP systems will produce a lot of transactional data from invoicing systems, purchasing systems. What these enterprise performance management methods do is they release the data like seeds from the ground by providing the information that you can make better decisions. Now, regarding analytics, you know, all of these various methods in EPM, planning, budgeting, uh, rolling financial forecasts, which is really where you have to go refresh that budget at periodic intervals, 
uh, enterprise risk management, process improvement, lean management, Six Sigma, you know, all of those moving parts, they're like gears and machine, you know, and they should be meshed seamlessly. That's how this whole kind of like methodology, you know, you know, can work. But if you embed analytics into each of the methods, analytics of off flavors, regression, correlation, um, uh, exponential smoothing, um, segmentation, you just get a lot more power. And I know some of the people listening to me said, oh, I took those courses in the university. I just wanted a passing grade and get out of there. Well, sorry, data science is here and it's a competitive advantage. So that was a long answer to what's caused interest in enterprise performance management and analytics. Great, thanks, thanks Gary. That was very elaborate. Um, now, now uh, you uh, you spoke of customer value management, and and uh, you know uh, I read one of your articles where you spoke about why customer lifetime value is uh, more important. Than just looking at uh, you know historical customer profitability, and it is important not just for companies but for shareholders as well. Uh, so, can you uh, talk a little more about that? Yeah. Now, customer lifetime value. Uh, only applies in the business to consumer space. So people who like are working for a retail company and their end customer is a consumer. It doesn't apply to business to business. That you can just do the profitability, activity-based costing and so forth. But the reason that customer lifetime value and the acronym is CLV applies in the consumer space is because Consumers go through life cycles. You know, young girls become teenagers. Teenagers become young mothers. Young mothers become grandmothers and so forth. And as they move through those various stages of their life cycle, they will purchase in different ways. And so what the company needs to know, and it's actually based on a discounted cash flow, net present value. Some of you may be aware of these sort of like um, – financial planning and analysis techniques is they want to know which types of, of these consumers are going to be of greater value to target with offers, deals, coupons, and, and the so forth. So that's what customer lifetime value is all about. Got it, got it. Now, uh, you know, in your uh, one of the uh, uh, books that you wrote, uh, I found this term called analysts should search for surprises, right? Which essentially means that they have to figure out something which is very counterintuitive possibly, or, you know, has got, you know, huge impact, right? But then uh, is it not akin to searching for needle in a haystack, right? So, so what are some of the practical approaches, uh, you know, from your experience that you can, you know, talk to our listeners? Yes. To tell our listeners? What the experienced analysts really want to do is sort of discover something that is new or different or contrary to the belief system. And in, in some cases, it can be shocking. I already gave you the example of your largest customer in sales is actually unprofitable. But you know, what's really needed is the facts. And this is something I typically say, in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. But usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So to the degree that those executives or higher up people are relying on their gut feel or intuition or flawed and misleading information, you know, back to this activity-based costing, when you do that, you discover compared to the external financial statutory reporting for regulatory agents, some of the products could be overcosted, the others must be undercosted. So it's flawed. So what the analysts, when you're when you use this term searching for surprises, once you have the facts, it's going to basically generate, you know, a lot of anxiety and questions and shock and surprise. But that's important. Because what you're really doing is you're surfacing problems and or opportunities. So, you know, experienced analysts, they're pretty good at it. And, they, you know, and they'll make they'll basically try to fail fast. What I mean by that is they'll have a hypothesis um, and they'll search it out, see if it works, move on to the next one. You know, in the U.S., we have a credit card company called Capital One 
I'm told they do hundreds of experiments all the time. They send out mailers. Is it on yellow paper? Is it on blue paper? Is the font size big? Is it small? And then they'll see how much of a hit or, you know, reaction from it. So that's what good analysts do. Okay, nice. Now you spoke of, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to transformation, you used uh, a terminology called D into V into uh, F should be greater than R, R standing for resistance to change, right? Uh, so if you could just explain what is D, V and F and, you know, give practical examples of how does one assess that and, you know, how does one then move the needle so that, you know, resistance can be overcome and transformation can happen. Yeah. Well, let me give just a little bit of background about re resistance to change, which is human nature. I'm very frustrated, as are others, with the slow adoption rate of many of these methods I described. Activity-based costing, maybe 5% of companies use it when in the 95 where it applies should be using it. But the slow adopt, same thing with balanced scorecards and strategy maps and KPIs. The problem is has really little to do with technology or systems or software. Um, it's really about people. And resistance to change is human nature. You know, only babies like change, I like <laughs> to say, you know, changing of diapers. And, and other obstacles are fear of others knowing the truth, or fear of being measured, or fear of being held accountable. Um, or even weak leadership. There I said it, you know, not every executive team's got the highest IQ. So how do you overcome resistance? Well, this formula, it's actually a multiplicative formula. It's D times V times F, the three of them must be greater than R. And, you know, to create change, you got to create the need for change. So you're asking, what's D, V, and F? Well, D stands for discomfort with the current state. Unless someone has dissatisfaction, they don't care. If they do have pain, then they're going to look for V, the vision, a vision of what better looks like, the solution. So you think if I've got big pain, big D in abundance, and I've got solutions like these enterprise performance management, I'm going to overcome the resistance. Ah, but F is the sleeper. F stands for first practical steps. Because if they believe your solution is overly theoretical, impractical, unaffordable, they're not going to basically continue. So to put this in the context of decision making, and I'll even apply it to myself, um, I used to, when I was earlier in my career, like, well, I have all this education and knowledge, you know, I kind of like show off. I realized, no, D comes from asking questions. You know, the Greek Philosopher Socrates, the Socratic method, he would, you turn to, so examples of questions of the executives, does everybody understand your strategy? Do we know where we make or lose money profitably? You know, are we measuring the right things? Things like that to kind of create what we call fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD, F-U-D, in the executives. And if you create that discomfort, they're going to say, well, yeah, how do, how do we explain? They, I don't understand. The managers don't understand the strategy. Well, there's the balance scorecard strategy map, Kaplan Norton. You can do that. So that's where the, the, the V comes in. F, I have techniques. And if the people are interested in it, I should, I'll give you my email address to communicate with me. It's G Kokins, G C O K I N S, at Gary Kokins. Dot com. I've been training consultants and CPA firms how to implement these methods using a technique called rapid prototyping with iterative remodeling. You, it starts off with a workshop, some people in the room, managers. You build a model quickly in a day. Next day, you bring in executives aligned managers. They see it. Light bulbs go on with everybody. Oh, that's how that works. They're going to get buy-in couple of iterations and you've got a permanent repeatable production system, not six months, you know, to a year. And that is an effective way of the first practical steps. It dispels all these rumors. Oh, it's too big. It's too complex. We can't afford it. You can get to results, you know, relatively quickly. I'm I'm an 80-20 guy, you know, the Pareto's law, you know, speed to results. Uh, uh, and when it comes to like cost accounting with ABC, our phrase is it's better to be approximately correct 
than precisely inaccurate. You know, mo most of the accountants are so hung up on precision and detail, even though they're using flawed methods. So, so that's the D times V times F uh, is greater than our formula. Oh, nice. So, so essentially, also that that helps in creating or building a narrative to get a buy-in from leadership, right? So you tell them what is flawed right now. Uh, you know, talk of vision of what great can be. And then, you know, practical next steps in terms of saying that, you know, you can see some sort of a needle moving in, in a more practical, you know, easy to move manner. And, you know, that gives them a comfort saying that, uh, you know, there is obviously uh, something positive or a pot of gold at the end of this particular, you know, initiative. And that gets a buy-in from them. Yes. Okay. Okay. Nice. So you, uh, I also read somewhere where you've spoken saying that uh, analysts uh, should beyond, you know, trying to explain the what uh, of, of a problem, they need to then explain the so what and then what, uh, right? Uh, yeah, so we use different terms for the way we explain this, but I just thought this what, so what, and then what uh, was very easy to remember and connect to. So, you know, with some practical examples, if you could just explain to us a what, a so what, and then what, in any practical uh, problem that you have solved. Well, examples of answering what is really many of the different methods, you know, cost accounting, measuring, uh, analytics, uh, regression, correlation, so you can see things. It's all of a sudden like, oh, now I understand what happened, okay? But that's through the rear view mirror. You know, it's what happened last week, last month, last quarter, last year, and you know, and so forth. When you use these e EPM, enterprise performance management methods and analytics, there's so much visibility. There's so much stuff is seen. I mean, it's like it's it's like a flood of information, but that's good. But at least then you have to ask the question, well, what's relevant? in all of this so this is answers we got the so what you know i see all this so what well this this that that makes sense and so forth but arguably the then what is the more important question because all decisions only impact the future now we're going through the car windshield and when you go through the windshield when you start doing forward looking things predictive you mentioned that I co-authored a book, Predictive Business Analytics. It's in Wiley. Uh, I did it many years ago. In fact, when I co-authored it with my co-author, I thought, oh, well, that's Mount Everest. On the stages of maturity, you know, that kind of goes from descriptive to diagnostic to predictive. That's as high as you can go. In the last couple of years, now there's a higher one, prescriptive analytics. Prescriptive is like optimization, you know, linear programming. Remember my undergraduate's operations research, you know, from Cornell. But there's a there's an angle on this predictive view. I call it in in the management accounting, I call it predictive accounting. One has to really think like an engineer. In fact, I always say, even though I was a division controller, age 27, look at me, 73 now, I've been in the finance and accounting space pretty much all the way through. I like to say I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. Here's why. When you go to the predictive view, you have to really classify the impact on resources as sunk, fixed, step fixed, or variable. You know, these are classifications that's really in decision analysis. And in the short term, almost all expenses are fixed. Why? Because you really can't adjust capacity quickly. You're not going to Oh, we'll fire employees on Tuesday because there's no orders in the house. We'll hire them back on Wednesday, you know, when, you know, no, we'll hang on to them for Tuesday and incur what we call some unused capacity. But as you go out weeks, months, years, you could replace the full time employees with contractors or temporary workers. You could lease assets that you would have bought. So this predictive view really requires a lot more engineering thinking and it's not and it would be used in rolling financial forecasts it'd be used in what if scenario analysis you know for example if we increase the assumption about our projected sales volume by five or ten percent or less five or ten percent what's going to be the impact and some of these financial planning and analysis software tools 
can actually, you know, do this kind of math. And then you can get a pro forma income statement and balance sheet. Very, that has really been of high interest to govern to board of directors with the COVID, because in co during COVID, they're like worried, what's the net cash flow to my company? You know, are they going to go bankrupt? And when you've got pro forma income statement and balance sheet, the next step is net cash flow. So that's a long answer to why the then what? What's the what's going to be the consequence of our decision? We need we need the math. No, absolutely. Yeah, you spoke of COVID, which was a black swan event, and uh, you know most companies were uh, caught napping for cash, uh, right? And and then there was obviously a lot of uh, cash flow modeling and sensitivity analysis that went in, and uh, possibly cash was something at that point they realized saying there is no shortage of cash and what it meant as consequence. Great. So uh, can you also talk to us about some examples of automated decision making using predictive analytics? Well, so we're still back to the computer in terms of being automated, meaning it does require, let's do a scenario analysis and I already gave you the example, you know, increase the scenario from baseline projection to what if it's 5% higher, 10%. So you're constantly changing a variable, an independent variable, and then these me these methods all will calculate the dependent variables. Underlying all of this is cause and effect relationships. The causality principle is so key when you're when you're doing modeling. So I'm just going to be brief on that. I really like to get to I think the next question you're going to ask me. OK, so. Uh... You know, uh, one is talking of the future of AI, you know, chat GPT-3 is happening. A uh, lot of low-code and no-code platforms are coming on the AI side of it, uh, right? And one believes that if you have context, you don't need to have a lot of programming and data analysis skills because if you know what to ask and how to ask, maybe it can solve problems. On the other side, there is a future of work which is emerging. A lot of freelancer migration is happening. People want to work when they want to work, where they want to work from, and you know uh, that type of stuff, and wherever they are, right? So, uh, and comfort companies are also getting comfortable with remote work, unless it's uh, you know blue collar work, most white collar people seem to be able to collaborate across distances and geographies. So, given the way future of AI is happening and the way future of work is happening. Do you see them somewhere, uh, you know, synergizing in the future or is it already happening? Well, it's it's just starting to happen and artificial intelligence, AI, robotic process automation, RPA, machine learning is going to impact organizations much quicker than people believe. They think, oh, it's 10 years away. No, it's not. And you said synergistic. Actually, there's a bit of a dark side to this. And actually, I encourage the attendees, if you want to watch a 20 minute video on YouTube, it's called Humans Need Not Apply. I'll describe mm -hmm. that if you want to write down Humans Need Not Apply. And it shows the impact of this. Like in as an example, in the accounting world, a computer is going to replace clerical people who do repeated manual work, accounts payable, invoicing, payroll, go on. The audit companies, the CPA firms doing the audit, the computer is going to basically monitor all of the transactions, no sampling, 100% because it can see it. So the audit is gone. That's why I've been training CPA firms to move to advisory services because the audit income is going to go down. They've got to then basically do consulting work, you know, as the like. Um, the month end close, which is uh, having been a financial controller, it takes two to three days to do all these journal entries. No, the computer gone. So the, the impact legal, you know, um, a, you junior attorneys go through stacks of paper to find some, you know, word or something. It's called discovery. That's a term. The computer will go through all of that gone. Um, clinical trials, drug recognition. You know, it's so complicated when a drug comes out, what drug will it affect? How, what were the interaction? AI can basically look at all of those correlations that would be impossible for a human to do in tens of years. So that's my brief answer. It's AI and RPA are coming and people are not prepared. Um, 
what the message really is for individuals like, well, my job could be replaced by a computer is get training, get certified, join professional societies, take ex extra courses, be a continuous learner. Got it. And so essentially what you're saying is, I mean, if I go back to your earlier answer, the what is somehow in terms of analysis and repetition will get done. Uh, but people who are able to get the context to say, so what, and then suggest that then what, are the people who are going to have, uh, you know, continuous employment stuff to do uh, and, and uh, contribute to business growth. Am I right in understanding that? You're absolutely correct. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so you have worked with a lot of organizations, Gary, and uh, you know you would have obviously spoke to, spoken to them about the methodologies and approaches that you spoke about today. Uh, what is the one major lesson that these organizations would have learned uh, when you know working with you and following the approaches? Well, one of the things that I think management teams and employees <clears throat> start realizing is the importance of good leadership. Now I'm talking about the executives at the top. And I'm not an expert in leadership, and I've not read. There's hundreds of books on you know leadership. But this is my observation. In the past, the best leaders and best executives had the best answers. Today, I don't think that's the case. Today, I think the best leaders and best executives have the best questions. There's too much volatility. There's too much uncertainty. There's too much complexity for them to rely on their gut feel or intuition or the types of answers they had successfully earlier in their career to get them promoted to the top. They need to create a culture of investigation and discovery which is where data science and analytics, you know, comes into play and tolerance for making mistakes as long as you learn from your mistakes. So my one lesson, um, the other one is overcoming resistance to change. That's another important lesson and being using rapid prototyping, quick methods. I call it crawl, walk, run, fly, soar. I'll say that again. Crawl, walk, run, fly. So start small, think big, you know, because uh, you'll basically get experience when you go through iterations. And, you know, then within a few weeks or shortly, you'll have these systems in place. But my my major observation uh, or um, lesson learned is you got to have executives that are don't think they have all the answers, but they will create solutions by asking people good questions. Excellent. No, very nicely articulated. Gary, thank you so much for making time. It's been a pleasure talking to you and listening to your insightful answers.